we are looking at at John, which is kind of exciting. <coughs> and just as kind of a a little bit of a review, uh, what are what are just a few things that make John distinct when we look at the Gospel of John and and sort of hold them up to Matthew, Mark, and Luke? What what are some things that causes John to stand out as a little different? His time is vertical rather than linear. Okay, so he has a very a vertical sense of time, at least in terms of our relationship with God. The others. You know, so more horizontal. It has a past, present, it develops. It moves to a point. For John, in the Gospel of John, it tends to be, you know, very vertical. Now, everything is now. And we'll see it again today. You know, it's, it's what's happening now. So that's the difference. What else? What else do we see in the Gospel of John that say, you'd say, oh, that's, that's interesting. Irony? Well, irony is a big deal. And when we say irony, what are some, uh, what would be some examples of, of the kind of irony that, that we see in, in John? A play on words. He loves plays on words. And in fact, we're going to look at one today, another little play on words. Um, and, it, and it really has to do, it has to do with uh, Greek grammar, uh, not word, like we saw last week. Uh, uh, so... Um, but we have so irony. Another irony we see in John a lot is that people make a statement. And, uh, or Jesus makes a statement and people will inevitably... Misunderstand. Misunderstand. And then Jesus does what? He explains it. You know, he explains it. And so, I'll tell you, one of the things that's really interesting, I think, in John, when you talk about Jesus, um, sometimes we have Bibles that have red letter Bibles. That the words of Jesus are in red, which I think are really that, those are really really cool. John, the Gospel of John, though, is a little it, it becomes a little different because when you have the other Gospels, Jesus is usually saying something, you know, telling a parable, you know, teaching a lesson. Say in John, sometimes Jesus is saying where, and then somebody responds, and he says, you know, that's good. Uh, you have these these exchanges that have bits and pieces. Well, unless you have somebody following along, writing that, and Jesus said, "Where? Okay, he's where? Uh, oh, oh, over there? Okay." You know, unless you had somebody writing it, then we we would assume, I would assume, that the evangelist is shaping the story. You know, he's not getting that that short little phrase exactly as as Jesus would have said. Um, you know, that he's kind of shaping the narrative. And that's something just to be aware of. That these, is, in fact, all the evangelists are doing it, but we see that maybe more in John than we do in the others, where kind of sayings are, are distinct. You know, these five, I ten... I think in John also you have much more read. We do, because Jesus talks a lot in John. You have these long monologues that you don't have in the others. Uh, you know, we'll see one, we saw one last week, we see one to this week. You know, where Jesus goes on and on and on explaining, and it gets even more so as we get into the gospel. That it's, but it's, it's they're different. Because when you look at the other gospels, he's, he's telling a lot of parables. And in the gospel of John, we see virtually no parables. You know, there's almost no parables in John, the gospel of John. It's, so what he says is a little bit different going on in John. Just a, just a really interesting uh, uh, a gospel. <clears throat> Something also to be very aware of, always have to be aware of it. Uh, in the Gospel of John, uh, Jesus knows exactly who he is, uh, why he came, uh, is in absolute control. Chapter one, Jesus has already said what? I'm son of God. I'm son of God. You know, we have to wait in Mark until chapter 15 to have any human being say it in the Gospel of, of John, boom, chapter 1. So it's, it, you're, it's an entirely different thing. The reader knows exactly who he is right from the beginning because human beings are saying it. Uh, you know, human beings are saying it in the, in, the, in the text itself. So his perspective is very different. We're reacting to someone who knows he's the Son of God and is in control of, of situations. You know, some calling stories are different. The calling of Peter is different in John 
the Gospel of John than it is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, you know, you have other characters that play a role. Uh, you know, uh, in John, Philip becomes a player. Thomas becomes a player in the Gospel of John. You don't see them in the other. You know, they're just figures, names on a list. But in John, they have roles to play. They do things. Um, so, which is a little bit, a little bit different. The origin story. The origin story. That, and I was going to mention that now. Now, what, what in the origin story do we see in the Gospel of John? That's what does the origin story do in this gospel? It puts it back to the beginning of time. But Jesus back to the beginning of the time. It also gives us images. Mm -hmm. And what are images that he's going to associate throughout his gospel with Jesus? Light. Jesus is light. Mm -hmm. Jesus is. Word. Word. Jesus is truth. You know, way. way. You know, we've got these images he introduces in that prologue that he's going to develop, you know, throughout his, his gospel. Um, when we looked at, uh, so we, we did that. What's, what did we see about John the Baptist in the gospel of John? What, how does John's role, how is it a little different? John the Baptist the first Christian. Okay, John the Baptist is the first Christian in the Gospel of John as opposed to the, prophet. the last prophet. And, and that becomes kind of a significant difference because he becomes a model that we can follow and we, we see that. Uh, what we, we talked in the uh, uh, second chapter about the uh, wedding at Cana and the temple and how do those two stories, and again, John's distinct, we got him cleansing the temple in chapter 2 as opposed to chapter 13. And, you know, so it's at the beginning, not the end. Uh, what, what, how do those two stories kind of tie together? That uh, Jesus is changing the religious structure. Okay, Jesus is changing the religious structure. Certainly he does it at the temple. And in the, in the wedding, this wonderfully symbolic you know, the celebration of the, of the groom, you know, that has all this Old Testament imagery in it that when the wine is one, run dry at the wedding, Jesus is the one that gives it, new life. gives it new life and the best life. And no longer do we need temple worship because Jesus is the place where you meet God. Okay, so we've got all of these where Jesus' role is being defined, and he's a lot of it, he's defining it himself. Last week we talked about his conversation with Nicodemus and John the Baptist and, uh, sort of exiting the, the stage. And what did we say last week with, with Nicodemus? What did we say with the, that conversation? <coughs> okay, a lot of irony in it. Uh, that Jesus makes his statement about uh, you've got to be born and then uses that word, that uh, enothen, uh, that has that dual meaning. And Nicodemus, of course, ta takes the wrong one and assumes that Jesus is talking about again instead of above and makes that bonehead statement. And Jesus then does what? He explains it. And in his explanation, what is his point? What's the point of his explanation? What point does he want Nicodemus? And, and after Nicodemus says, how can this be? He's gone. You know, we don't see Nicodemus again until later in the, in the gospel story. But this conversation, he's over. What's Jesus' point when he talks about being born from above and the spirit being free? And, and what, what is he trying to convey to Nicodemus? It shouldn't be structured by law. Okay, it, it is no longer to be structured by law. In fact, it's kind of... It, it involves who? This, 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 this spiritual birth. Where is, this, where is the focus going to be now? On the heart. Okay, well, it's going to be on him. Yeah, right, Jesus. because remember he says, like the serpent is lifted up in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, yada, yada, yada. So it's going to be, this is going to be that image that's going to you know, reflect this new birth, this birth from above. And this is what he's telling Nicodemus. Same sort of thing he's already told uh, in those two, the two miracle stories, the cleansing of the temple and the wedding of Cana, that we got a new sheriff in town. And things are now going to be changing. changing. Not, not only changing, things have improved, have improved and changed. 
And, and so it's a, we're, we're looking at a new world now. And we're going to continue that kind of theme in what we're looking in chapter 4. So as we're, we're in chapter 4, what's, what is happening right at the beginning of, of chapter 4? Um, the Pharisees um, heard that Jesus was g- gaining and baptizing. Okay, the Pharisees here. Remember, I told you, and it's and it's true. You don't Pharisees don't play this major role in in John like they do in others. Usually in John, it's the Jews, the Jews, and he doesn't he doesn't present a nuance because his community evidently doesn't isn't facing you know sort of a fragmented Judaism. You know, they seem to be separate. So uh, now when, when he talks about this baptism, where is he, where is he getting this baptism business? When he learned that Jesus has been baptizing more disciples than John, where, where did that come from? Yeah, I mean, where does when he when he starts in chapter four that they the Pharisees hear that Jesus is is baptizing more disciples than John? Where are they getting that? Have have we heard that before? Is this news to us that Jesus is baptizing more than than John the Baptist? Well, didn't we say yes, before? yes, that's right. So it's not news to us, right? Because at the end of chapter three, that um, John was taking the back seat to Jesus. Exactly. Knew so people were leaving. So what is the writer doing? What is what is the evangelist John doing by starting this this new story with that? He's tying it to what he's already talked about. You know, so we, the reader, know this is, this is what he was talking about. But it's also showing us that the Pharisees were keeping an eye on it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, so, and, but then John, and this is, again, this is one of those typical things in John, uh, you know, that it's, because he's already dealt with this with John the Baptist, you know, that when John's disciples came to John, the Baptist, and said, oh, Jesus is baptizing more than you. Jesus, and everybody's going to him. And John says, That's good. That's good. In fact, that's <clears throat> inevitable because I've got to decrease while he increases. That's, that's right. That's the way it's going to be. I find that an interesting <clears throat> statement when I apply it to myself because I have to become less and Jesus has to become more. That becomes the goal. Right? And, and if John is an example of discipleship, which I believe he is, uh, then that, that should be our goal. How do we decrease? How do, we, how do we help people focus more? How does Jesus become more important? Um, I've told people, I've said before, you know, sometimes I just hope to get out of the way. You know, <laughs> just get out of the way. Uh, you know, God's will is going to be done. The question is, am I... Am I, in, am I facilitating it or am I in the way? It's going to be done, but am I facilitating or in the way? And I think sometimes I'm in the way. You know, I, get, I put myself in the way. Um, and therefore, and the good news is, God still loves us. Uh, you know, God doesn't love us because we're out of the way. God loves us because... We are. And he is. Yeah, and he is. Uh, and and that's, that's the good news. Uh, the not so good news is sometimes we put ourselves in the way, uh, but God is greater than than us. So anyway, the the uh, but so they could they hear about this. Uh, it's interesting, and and this is again something we'll see again over and over again in the Gospel of John. Uh, it says that here's that Jesus is baptizing more than than John, but the the evangelist John needs feels the need to do what. Clarify. clarify it, which is typical of John. And what's his clarification? But the disciples were actually doing Yeah, but it was the disciples that were actually doing the baptizing, uh, that it wasn't Jesus. Now, why does he feel the need to do that? Why does John need the fee? The evangelist feels the need to say, oh, but by the way, it wasn't Jesus who was doing the baptism, it was his disciples. Because it doesn't make a hierarchy of Christians. Okay. Yeah, I, I I'm not sure why. I'm, yeah, that could be. Yeah, I don't I don't know. But he evidently he feels well, the need I to do it. Jesus baptized me. 
<laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, that's that could be that you know. Well, I was bad. Well, and and we get that. Well, you know, we do. We're yeah, awesome. I was bad. When we get back to Paul, we see it's still happening. Oh, absolutely. Well, geez, for we well, I was baptized in the Jordan. Well, I was immersed. Well, I was sprinkled. Well, shame you were sprinkled. Yeah. Well, so it. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so, uh, but but he. This we're going to see that again. You know, that John just puts these little in inclusions, almost in parentheses, these little parenthetical thoughts in here to clarify. You know, when I talk about Judas, he'll put in. Oh, but Jesus knew Jesus was going to betray him. When Jesus, Jesus asks Judas a question, he'll say, oh, but Judas knew, Jesus knew what Judas was going to say. Uh, well, John feels the need to do that, even though it breaks the narrative a little bit. John still feels the need to include that, so we, the reader, understand. Well, that understand. shows that what Jesus did with um, Judas, it didn't matter he was going to betray. Yeah. You know, it shows that he, you know, he loved them the same. Judas and John is going to be a pretty scuzzy guy. He's going to be a pretty bad guy. Uh, as opposed to the other ones. Judas, Judas comes off the worst in the Gospel of John. He's a pretty bad guy. Because uh, he's a thief. And none of the other ones deal with, with that. But that's what, that's what John will say. Okay, so we've got... Now this becomes... This really becomes a reason to explain why Jesus ends up doing something else. He Judea. So he leaves, leaves Judea. Because evidently, there's, John sees this as an issue. Uh, and so it pushes Jesus out, and he's heading back where? Where is he going to go? Galilee. He's going to go back to Galilee. And to go back to Galilee, what does he need to do? Where does he, where does he go between Judea and Galilee? Samaria. He goes through Samaria. Now, why is it significant that he goes through Samaria? Because he didn't have to. Well, he doesn't. <laughs> <coughs> Should have taken a circuitous route because you don't mess with the Samaritans. You you don't you don't know why, well why? Because we're gonna we we see this later uh, that there's the the woman talks about hostility between mm -hmm. Jews and Samaritans. What's the deal with Samaritans? I mean Luke and Luke we got this the parable of the Good Samaritan. Uh, so we as Christians, we don't have a negative view. Modern Christians don't have a negative view of Samaritans. In fact, we kind of got a, pair of, a positive view because of the Good Samaritan. Clearly, this is not reflecting a positive view. What's the deal between Jews and Samaritans? Um, the way they chose to worship God was different from what the Jewish people did. Okay. But they still kind of had the same background. <coughs> Didn't they? Interesting, Samar we're, we're really interesting. It's sort of an interesting background. Because remember, way back, Solomon. Solomon, Solomon dies. Boom, he's dead, right? He's got a son, Rehoboam. Mm -hmm. Rehoboam is the son, Solomon's son. And Rehoboam has, uh, he's, he's from the tribe of Judah, southern tribe. He, um, and we've got this sort of tribal confederation with these northern tribes, too. Mm -hmm. And some of the northern tribes think that Judah is getting special treatment. Capital is in Judah. Judah's getting special treatment. A lot of the money that he's raising in taxes is going for building projects where? In Jerusalem, someplace else. And so they feel overtaxed and underrepresented. And... Uh, they, when he is now king, uh, they go and send a delegation under a guy named Jeroboam. And they say, we think we are getting the short end of the stick. So we, unlike your daddy, we would like you to treat us a little better, be a little more equitable. And Jer Rehoboam has advisors and his older advisors say, that yeah. makes a lot of sense. sense. And the that younger advisors. And the younger advisors say, put your thumb on the heart. You gotta bring down the hammer. You know. And that's Jerry. So Rehoboam listens to the younger guys and he says, you know, my my daddy, you know, my finger is as big as my dad's wrist. And you think you had problems under him. You ain't you ain't seen nothing yet. You know. He beat you with bull whips. I'm going to beat you with 
four whips times 10, I'm gonna really come down on you. And they say, oh, well that's interesting. Bye. And so the northern tribes leave. Now you got a problem though with these northern tribes leave. Because where- You can't go to Jerusalem. You, you can't go to another town, country to worship. If the center of your worship is in another country, you got a problem, right? You got to worship your God where? Where, you where you're living. And so you've got to worship the God of Israel in Israel. You can't worship in, in Judah. The area. Yeah. <laughs> so you build a temple on a mountain, Gizram, in Samaria, high place, close to God. You build a temple out there. That's where you're going to worship God. This is the God of Israel out there. Now, for the for the Jews in Jerusalem. Where do you worship God? Only in Jerusalem. Only in Jerusalem. So anybody from the... sacrifice there. Well, that's right. That's where you're, you're performing the sacrifice. And that's what worship is all about. And so anything that's being written in Jerusalem is going to say the northern kingdom is... Pagan. Yeah, it's pagan. It's wrong. Mm. I mean, it's, it's just wrong. You know, because there's one place to worship God. It's in Jerusalem. If you are not worshiping God in Jerusalem, you are... Wrong, 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 wrong. You're afraid of worshiping a false god. And so that's automatic. That's why when you read the histories, the histories of, are written in the South. All the histories are written in the South. That's why you don't have any good northern kings. They're all bad. Why are they all bad? Because they all worship God in the wrong place. I mean, duh. You know. So you got one problem. They don't like where it's worshipped. Now the problem is, Assyria does what to the northern kingdom? crushes them. And the Assyrians transported the people out. And one of the things they did to, to pacify their empires, they would transfer populations. Mm -hmm. Move the people. Then you don't have rebellions. You know, if you move the Jews away from Samaria, if you move the Jews away from Israel and put them somewhere on the else in the empire, are those Jews way out on the fringe of the... Are they going to fight for land that they have never even been in? Heck no, they don't care. They're shipping these guys into Israel. Are they going to fight for Israel? Heck no, they don't care. You know, so that's, that's how the Assyrians kept their empire peaceful. Peaceful. Oh, really expensive moving people around. That's really hard to do, and you don't do it particularly successfully. But that's what the Samaritans, that's what the Babylonians did. Persians and Romans had a whole different philosophy on how to pacify an empire, but that's not what the Assyrians did. So you ended up with not only in the ancient time were the Samaritans worshiping false gods because they weren't worshiping in Jerusalem, the Assyrians had sent in a bunch of foreigners into Israel and they weren't even Jews. You know, so the people who were in Judah looked at the Samaritans and they said, They're not Jews. They worship a false god and they own even ethnic Jews. Mm -hmm. You know, so they are pagan, pagan wrong, wrong. wrong <laughs> and scuzzy. You know, they are scum of the earth. You know, in fact, in some ways they were even worse than foreigners because they were half-breeds who kind of claimed to be sort of, uh, but, but weren't. And so they, the, the good Jews hated the Samaritans and the half Samaritans hated the Jews. I mean, there was a mutual dislike between the two. But, it, you know, the Samaritans <coughs> knew about God. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they were worshiping different would upset the Jews anyhow mm -hmm. because, you know, even though they were worshiping the same God, they were obviously doing it wrong. Exactly. But... Right. She knew the Messiah was coming. Right. And so... Well, and see, that becomes part of the history, too, because they're at the well of Jacob. And, and she talks about Jacob's well. So they share this common history, too. Yeah. So the Samaritans see themselves, and the Jews see themselves, as a connection between the two, but neither one of them has honored what was supposed to be true in, in this history. It would be kind of like, you know... In the South, we'd have white trash and what and the the, the government sure. body. So it, you know, you'd have that delineation between. <coughs> Absolutely, it, you know, it, it, 
At this is this may be a, a compare and, and may not apply at all, but it just strikes me as a southerner, you know, because there's certain symbols, southern symbols, mm -hmm. uh, some good, some some not so good. One of the things that always causes me to do this, just like this, is when I'm up above the Mason Dixon line and I see people with Confederate flags outside the houses. I don't understand it. I don't understand why a Yankee has a Confederate flag. <laughs> that doesn't make sense to me because his granddaddy fought under the United States flag and people under the Confederate flag were trying to kill him. Mm -hmm. And why would he have that hanging outside his house? I don't get it. Uh, and, and, it, and it just, and it, in a sense, it kind of bothers me. It used to bother me more than it does now. I don't care so much now. But it used to really bother me. You know, what do they do? Leave it alone. You know, if that's a Southern symbol, let it be a Southern symbol. Don't do it. Don't take that away from the South. That's South, that's Southern. Uh, that's kind of what they're talking about. Yeah. You know, you're claiming these images, but you don't deserve to claim them because you don't worship in Jerusalem. You know, you're not in the South, don't you fly that flag. You know, that's not part of your history. Um, that's, a, that's something that's not nearly as important, but for the Jews, that's kind of what was going on. You don't deserve this. Anyway, so Jesus is in this country, and they don't like him, and he don't like them, right? And, and so what ends up, where does he, where does he end up stopping in this what does, it, what, what does the writer tell us about where Jesus stops? Jacob's, Jacob's well. Okay, Jacob's well. Um, and Jacob uh, is kind of significant. Because he is Israel. Because he is Israel. So this becomes a big deal. So he's at Jacob's well. And um, what, what happens at Jacob's well? The disciples go off and leave him alone. Okay. Disciples are gone. Who, who comes to the well? Okay, we got it. Now it's really interesting. He's sitting by the well. What time is he sitting? He, it says noon. Now remember, just file it away because one of the things we've already said John loves to do is he loves light and dark, right? And we talked about Nicodemus. When did Nicodemus see Jesus? In the dark. Now Jesus is sitting by the well. In the light. In the light at noon. So when that Samaritan woman comes, she ain't coming to him at, in, at twilight or in the middle of the night. She's coming to, to him at noon in the day. And I think that's kind of significant. Uh, not a surprise that Nicodemus is in the Jewish leadership and the Samaritan woman isn't. So anyway, so she, he's there and Samaritan woman shows up and she's there to do what? Get water. She's there to, to get water. And Jesus says to her what? Can I have a drink? <clears throat> Can I have a drink? But even more dramatic than that, he says, Will you give me a drink? Give me a drink. You know, this is an imperative. He gives an imperative. Give me a drink, woman. Uh, give me a drink. What, what does she say? I'm a Jew. You're a Jew. You're a Jew. And then you talk to me? Yeah, why are you talking to a woman from Samaria? Why are you talking to a woman? Why are you talking to Samaritan? Samaritan? Why are you talking to a <coughs> Samaritan woman? Okay. And why would she say that? Because Jews don't. Judges don't, don't share much in common with Samaritans. Uh, again, little parenthetical statement that John wants the, us, the reader, to know in case we don't know already. Okay, so it's, it's kind of interesting by what she's saying. And, and again, file this away. When she says, oh, by the way, you're a Jew, you asked me for water, and I'm a Samaritan woman. Uh, you know, implied in that is that maybe Jesus represents more than just, than just Jews. Now, you know, because Jews don't do this, but Jesus is. Jesus when you think is. of all the rules, <coughs> even taking water and washing your hands and all these things, and you know, obviously her utensils wouldn't be kosher. There you go. I mean, duh. 
Yeah, right. She's a Samaritan woman. Ugh. Dirty hands, right? What does Jesus reply? How does he reply? If you knew who was asking for that. Okay. If you knew, if you knew who was asking, you'd do what? You would ask him. Something. You'd ask him, and what would he do? He'd give you living water. He'd give you living water. Now, right here, we, we got another little word for it. Because we got living water. What what does what would living water mean? I mean, what are possibilities of of living water? Well, if you were dead, it'd make you alive. <laughs> well, yes. Think about think about living water. Twenty third song, right? What what is living? What is what is living water? If, if I've got a, a flock of sheep and I say, I'm, man, I'm looking for living water, what kind of water am I looking for? Not I'm looking for water that isn't stagnant, right? I'm looking for water that's flowing. that's flowing, that's not stagnant. So living water can simply mean water that is that living. It's fresh, you know, flowing, not stagnant. You know, that's living water. But if you look at, if you look at Greek grammar, living water can also using those two together, can also mean, grammatically, water that gives, life. that gives life. Now, they're not necessarily contradictory, but they're slightly different, right? You know, living water is simply water that moves. You know, therefore it's fresh. You can, you can trust it. You know, water that gives life, you know, living water as life-giving water, that may be a little bit different. Now, that's what he says. You'd be asking me, if you knew who I was, you'd be asking me for and I would give you living water. So there's an ambiguity. Now, did we see that same ambiguity in his conversation with Nicodemus? Well, of course we did. And what was the ambiguity surrounding? Again and, Again and above. The same kind of ambiguity, only that time it was around a word. Now this is around a phrase, right? Now, if, if there's a pattern, if John falls into a pattern, then we would expect the woman to do what? Say question oh, one. To question one. That's know? right. We would expect her to take the wrong, make the wrong assumption. You know, because that's what Nicodemus did. And then Jesus explained it. We would expect the same, the same sort of thing to happen. And so what happens here? That's exactly what happens. She assumes he's talking about what? The water. The water. Water from the way he she assumes he's talking about fresh water. You know, that you, if, you, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me and I'd give you fresh water. And she says, How do you do that? Without how are you going to do it without a bucket? How are you going to do that without a bucket? Now, we, when, as soon as she says that, we know we're that, not talking about that, water. that we're not talking about this water. We're, we're not talking about water. We're not talking about water at all. And she pushes it even further. Because she says, where are you going to get it? And are you suggesting what? That you're greater than Jacob. That you're greater than Jacob, who gave all this water to his flocks. Okay. So right here, she's setting up what? She's a straight story. For Jesus. She, she's setting up a new, a new story. Yeah. She's setting up a contrast, right? Between... Jesus and, and, Jacob. and Jacob. You know, Jesus and this figure in, in history. So she's, she's taken the water the wrong way, but she's also setting up this, this little contrast between Jesus, Jesus and Jacob. Jesus is greater than Israel. It, it, that's exactly right. And what's Israel? <coughs> that's exactly right. And it's, and it's kind of ironic that it's a Samaritan that's doing this, not a Jew. Because for a Jew, it would be the same thing. Jacob would be superior to anybody. I mean, that's Israel. Yeah. You know, but it's the fact that it's a Samaritan doing it makes it kind of ironic. How does, this, how does Jesus resolve this contrast that she set up? Who is better? Um, are you suggesting you're better than Jacob? How does Jesus respond to resolve this little, this little contrast that she has set up? 
anybody who drinks the well water is still thirsty, but if you drink this one, you won't be. Okay, so we know he's talking about the spiritual. We're talking about something spiritual, right? We're talking about life-giving water, not living water, moving water, fresh water. We're talking about water that does more than that. You know, it's some kind of a life, life-giving water. And in a sense, she says, are you saying you're greater? What is Jesus saying? And he says, yeah. He's saying, yes. You're, yes, yes, I am greater. Because the water, what your ancestor Jacob gave you, you still get thirsty. You still get thirsty. But I give you because it's living water. But this is living water. You know, Jacob gave you living water, but you got to keep on drinking it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you living water, <coughs> and it'll flow from you. It's going to flow from you, and it's going to gush up, and it's going to gush up to what? What image that we just heard in chapter three does Jesus use again? Eternal life. Eternal life. Now, as Often we, we do, when we think of eternal life, we think of life in the future. But remember, we're in the Gospel of John. That's not, how, that's not what eternal life means. What is he then talking about? What is eternal life? It's a relationship with God. So what is Jesus saying to this, what is Jesus saying to this woman? Yes, you're right. I am saying I'm superior. Because Jacob's water is living, but you've got to keep on drinking it. The water I'm going to give... Is truly living water because it helps you with your, it helps you with your relationship with uh, God. A, a living and eternally living mm -hmm. relationship with God, and it's something that's being produced inside of inside of you. Now, what makes that offer in this context so incredibly radical? What makes this offer so incredibly radical that Jesus is making? The fact that it's to a Samaritan. He's woman. making it to a Samaritan. And, he and is. And to a woman. And to a woman, yes. Yeah. That's worse than the dog. <coughs> yes. You know, when he was dealing with Nicodemus, okay, leader, a male leader of the Jews. But he's making him to, making this to a Samaritan, half breed, foreigner woman. Woman. Lord have mercy. How does the woman. Respond. She wants the water. She wants the water. She wants the water. Now, why is that significant that she that she wants water? Although the way she says it, we the reader would say she still mm -hmm. doesn't seem like she really is clear about what she's asking. This is another example of irony. Mm -hmm. Because it would seem for her she's still vague about, well, give me the water because I don't want to keep on having to come to this well. You know, so I'd, I'd love water being produced inside of me because carrying these buckets, this wears me out. Mm -hmm. But we the, we, the reader, hear what she says and we say... Oh, how silly girl. Well, we say how silly. On one hand, yeah, she, she still doesn't get it, but you know something? She's real close. Mm -hmm. She's real close. You know, that is exactly what what people want would want. Yet give me this living water. Get, that's, that's what I need. I, I don't want to continue to be thirsty. You know, we, we read and say, you know, on one level, she still doesn't get it. On another level, what she's asking for she is... She wants the relationship with God. Wants the relationship with God. This is really profound, what she's asking for. In fact, we haven't seen anything quite as profound as that. Uh, she may not realize she's making it, but we do. Thank you. Uh, so anyway, so she she makes that statement. <coughs> what does Jesus ask her? And and we want to be real careful with this because I think he this is something really cool going on here. What does he What does he ask her? Go call your husband. Go go call your husband and come back. And she responds by saying what? I don't have a husband. I don't have a husband. And Jesus says what? You answer truthfully. Well, you yeah, answer true truthfully. Uh, in fact, you've had, five husbands. you've had five husbands and the one you have now isn't your husband. Now we say, okay, well clearly she's, you know, a, a woman with a shady past. Aren't we all? She's a Samaritan. What might, how might that be, that little thing about husbands and 
the one you're with now is in your husband. How might it represent more than just a marital relationship? Uh, a personal she relationship. By serving the right God. Yes. Yes. She's right here. The so that's the problem with Samaria. You know, that they they haven't it's it's a matter of who they're married to, their spouse. You know, they haven't been married to the true God, the God of Israel, for years. For centuries. For centuries they haven't been married. They haven't been married to the God of represented in the temple in Jerusalem. The true God, for, for, for centuries they haven't. That divorce, and they've been married, but they've been married to what? Other, other gods. The other pictures of God. Oh man, they've had relationships with all these other gods throughout their histories, the history. And now, you know, in the first century, they have a relationship, but it ain't even official now. You know, I think so much more is going on than him just going through her personal life. This is the history of Samaria, is what he's kind of summarizing. You know, you as a Samaria, Samaritan, you, you, you haven't had a legitimate relationship for, for centuries, for centuries. And, and that relationship is still, is still, is still, Huge. You've been war worshiping falsely. And that, that explains the fact that he says it has encapsulized her history, their history. I think that explains why her response is so dramatic, right? Because how does the woman respond to him? I can see you're a prophet. <clears throat> Man, you've got to be a prophet. And then what does she say? We worshiped on this mountain. Okay, we were, now they haven't been worshiping on that mountain for a long time. You know who tore down that little temple on the mountain? The kings of Judah tore down that little mountain, that little mountain uh, temple. You know, so the Jews tore down the temple that Israel put up on that mountain. And so he says, you, she says, we used to worship on that mountain. You guys worship in, in Jerusalem. How does Jesus respond? A time is coming when you won't worship in any either place but in me. And we're thinking, has the, has the time come? Not quite yet. Well, remember, what did Jesus say in the temple? Time is now. Time is now. Remember the, the wedding of Canaan in Galilee? It's not my time yet. The banquet, but what did he do? He did it. He did it anyway. He, he took that cleansing water and turned it into wine. You know, that ceremonial cleansing water, he turned it into wine. So the party had, had this richness again. And he goes into the temple and he eliminates the, what is absolutely essential to Jewish worship. And when they said, how can you do that? He says, Destroy the temple and build it again in three days. Because He's in the I'm the place. I am now the place where you worship God. I am the one that brings wine and newness and bounty to the wedding feast. This is who. This is now who I am. My people, you know, the Jews worshipped in Jerusalem. That's fine. Y'all worshipped on the mountain. That's fine. You know what? You're all changing. Everything's changing. Everything's changing. And and where are you going to be worshiping from now on? Truth. Right here. Spirit and truth. Spirit and truth. It's going to be grounded in God. And that's, that's what he told Nicodemus too. The spirit moves where it wants. This is where you're going to be worshiping God from now on. Things have absolutely changed. Things have absolutely changed. Why have they changed? Because Jesus is here. I'm here. I'm here. And that changes, changes everything. And, and see... That explains why some of her responses are so powerful and dramatic. You know, that all of a sudden, after this thing about marriages, who you've been married to in the past is irrelevant. You know, it's not, it doesn't matter who you used to worship. What matters is what? Your relationship. Your relationship right now. That's what's important. You know, that's what becomes important. And, and, and she responds to him. So he says, he says, man, things have, 
have changed. Now things have changed because I am here and I change everything. Everything has changed. And how does she respond? We know the Messiah is coming. We, we know the Messiah is coming. Again, because he's writing to an audience who can't speak Hebrew. He does what? He says he defines, he defines, oh, that's, let me use the Greek word that you all know, uh, Christ. Uh, <coughs> and when he comes, he's going to do what? He's going to explain everything, right? Now, really important that historically, the Samaritans had intended to look for Messiah. Because they weren't looking for that great Davidic king to set them free. That's what the crystals did. The kings didn't have, the, the people of Israel, the Samaritans didn't have, didn't have that. So this is something that John is putting in, in the, word, in the, mouth, in the mouth of a Samaritan. It really doesn't apply to her, but it does to his audience. You know, the audience hears, him, hears her say that. That the Messiah is going to come and, and going to change everything. And how I find it interesting that Nicodemus didn't mention anything about the Messiah. Uh -huh. Christ. No, he didn't. So here she is confirming That's what right. Jesus said, what John said in the first chapter. That's exactly right. And she's the one that asks him the question that enables him to, to give say who he is. The answer that, that reveals who he is. Mm -hmm. And it's through her question that he's able to reveal himself for who he is. Because when he says, when she says, the, uh, when he comes, the, the Messiah will proclaim all things to us, Jesus responds by saying, I am he. Oh. I am he. Ago a me. Ago a me. And we've said that before. One of the things, ago a me, is I am that I am. I am. Uh, that's the voice in Greek of coming from the bush, the burning bush. When Moses asked, who should I say is sending me? The voice in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the voice from the burning bush says, ago a me, ago a me. And, and in Greek, ago a me, ego is, is, is the pronoun. But usually pronouns are part of verbs. So you don't have a separate pronoun. You only have a separate pronoun when you want to make it emphatic. And that's what you have. A, a, go, a, a me is I am. A me is I am. But when you say a go, which is the pronoun, you're saying I myself am. I, I, me, me, I am. So you're making it emphatic. And that's the voice that's coming from the bush. And that's what Jesus says. A go, a me. He doesn't just say a me which would be appropriate, that means I am, but it's that a go on me. And we're going to see in John, a go on me is going to be a big deal. You know, there are a lot of things. I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the good shepherd. I, I am the gate. I am the vine. Yes, I, you know, he's that a go on me. In fact, <coughs> when we finish this series after Pentecost, going to do a series on I, the I am statements in the Gospel of John during service. <coughs> I'm going to look at John where Jesus says, I am, because those become really important in John. Okay, so he, he makes this statement about himself, and what is he saying about himself? What is, what is the evangelist having Jesus say here about himself to the Samaritan? The that he is not just the Messiah, because that voice from the bush isn't the voice of the Messiah. He's God. It's the voice of God. It's the voice of God. So when he says, I go on me, he's claiming, I am the Son of God. I am. I am God. I am God. It's right. I, I am. The, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I am. Now, boom. That's, that's powerful. Who immediately arrives? The disciples arrive, and, and how do they react? <coughs> okay. to a woman. They surprise because of the, the woman, and what does the woman do? So they react in a way that is, is a natural reaction. Mm -hmm. What does the woman end up doing? She leaves her jar and goes to find her husband. She leaves the jar and she goes back to town. Back to town, right? And what does she do when she gets back to town? She tells the good news. 
she tells the good news. What has she become? A disciple. She's become a disciple. She's become a witness. She is doing the exact same thing that John the Baptist did. And the disciples and Andrew. Andrew did. Philip did. She is doing the exact same thing that the other disciples have done. She's taking this truth and sharing it. Sharing. And how did those Samaritans respond? When she does this, how did the Samaritans respond? What's that? They come to find out themselves. They come to find out themselves. And and what have um, <coughs> what what has now Jesus shown himself to be? Since the Samaritans are coming, right? The Samaritans are coming. What what is now Jesus shown himself to be? The, the Christ. The Christ, but even more than the Christ. Because the crystals involves who? Involves the Jews, right? Crystals, the, the Messiah. What has Jesus become? What do, what do they say he's become? Well, Rabbi, even more than that. Right at the end, verse 42. Because they come... Oh, they believe he's the same Savior. The Savior of what? The world. The Savior of the world. And we, the reader, can say, yeah, he yeah. is Savior of the world, because what's happening? He's saving Samaritans. He's saving Samaritans. You know, so he's showing himself to be Savior of the world. Now, is this, is, is this a shocker? What was the mission we got in the prologue? What was going to be the mission of the word? What was the word? What did the word become? Come and follow me. He became. What did the word? What did the word become? He became flesh and. Um, he became flesh. What did you? What did? What was he called? The logos. He was called the logos. What else was he called? The light. The light. The light of what? The world. The light of the world. The light of the world. That's what he's become. He's become the light of the world, the savior of the world. And he's doing it by reaching down to Samaritans. My gosh. And, and that's what the Samaritans realize, right? That's what they realize. So those Samaritans have come to what conclusion? The, they can have a relationship with God. They can have a relationship with God through, through Jesus. Through Jesus. And what you said earlier about Nicodemus is, I think, right on. Because Nicodemus never leaves the conversation with Jesus coming to that conclusion. He just disappears. But not the Samaritans. Not only does the woman bear witness, but her witness bears fruit. What has occurred in Samaria? What has occurred in, in Samaria? Samaria? They've been evangelized. They've been evangelized. They've been evangelized. Now, I, I find it interesting that in the <coughs> concept, the people that aren't Samaritans, they have a higher opinion of them because they don't know God at all. These people kind of know God, but yet they get it first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. I find that so so ironic that, you know, if you kind of know God and then God is presented to you, you're willing to accept it. Mm -hmm. You're so willing. But if you have a <coughs> God that is right or wrong, you're not willing to accept any change to it. I think that's, ex I think that's an excellent observation. I, I think I, I agree. I would agree with that. Makes it very hard. It's and hard because you already know you're right. You know, how do you change right? If God has to convict your heart that something is wrong and you're right before you can change it. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Um, you know, those are the ones who are satisfied. Uh, the ones who are that I think they're satisfied are really are the ones are the ones like that are in lost. The revelation it says you, you think you're white and your clothes are dirty. Yeah, that's that's right, and and those are the ones that are that end up becoming more separated. What ends up happening <coughs> to Jesus in thirty and thirty four? 
Where does Jesus end up going? In 34. Uh, 44, 43, I'm sorry. 43, yeah. he uh, go, uh, left Galilee. Yeah. Okay, he's, he's going back to Galilee. Uh, and um, what, what do the Galileans know? He has no honor in Galilee. Everything that he has done. They, they know everything that they he's done. So, so they already know it all and they can't be taught anything. That's, that's right. Now, in Galilee, where does he go? Cana. Cana. Oh, wait a minute. Wait, wait. That's where we had Cana. the wine. Oh, yeah, we had the wine. So he's back to the place where we had the deal with the wine. All right. Uh, what happens uh, in, in Cana? A uh, royal official from Capernaum comes to him and says, "My daughter's sick." Okay. Come, come to you. The the that his daughter sick. We've seen parallel stories in the other gospels. What does Jesus say to him? <coughs> Unless you have a sign or wonder, you don't believe. Okay. And then what does he say to to Jesus? Oh, just come before my kid dies. Okay. And what does Jesus say? You go. Your, your son will live. And how does the person respond? He just did. He left. Well, what does, but John adds a word in that sentence that becomes, I think, it, really oh, perfect. He, believed he believes. And, and so what's occurred now? In, in, we saw it in Samaria. What's occurred now in Galilee? He is a disciple now. We, we got a new disciple. Mm -hmm. We got somebody who believes, believes. right? And, and in John, believing has more to, has less to do with just trust and more with sort of affirming that Jesus is God. who he claims he is, which is, which is God. And, and what happens? Well, he's on his way home, his servants come and say that he was healed. And what does he, what hits him as when he hears when that? When it happen? it happened exactly when Jesus said it would. Okay. He said, go. And what occurs? What's the result? The whole house. Believes. The whole house believes. Not only does he believe, but the entire house believes. And and John says, "This the is you, yeah, the second miraculous the, sign. The second sign after coming from Ju Judea to Galilee. And we now know that signs do what? What do signs do?" What's the purpose signs of the confirm. signs? Signs confirm. Signs lead to the faith. It's interesting. There was no <coughs> miraculous sign of Nicodemus. What's that? There was no miraculous sign of Nicodemus. No. That, you know, it's the fact that they believe that they got miraculous signs, mm -hmm. not the fact that he did what Jesus did. <coughs> I think that's the sign. They simply accepted that Jesus was who he says he was. Uh, now, what's, what's interesting with Nicodemus in John, and we've talked about this before, is Nicodemus is going to show up twice again in yeah. John. And <clears throat> each time Nicodemus will, will have moved a little bit. So Nicodemus in chapter 3, we never get a sense that he's anything other than in the dark. Uh, but a little bit later... We're going to find that Nicodemus, is he understands a little, no, he, exactly. Remember, it's that, well, let's see. You know, I'm not sure, but let's, let's give him some rope. Because if I give him rope, if he's wrong, that's going to be obvious. But if he's right, then we need to know. And then at the end, Nicodemus yeah, is going to be involved in the, in the burial. Uh, so we're going, to, we're going to see Nicodemus develop in the Gospel of John. But to this point, we've got, what, what has chapter four told us about Jesus that we really didn't, hadn't seen before? How does chapter four push John's narrative? Uh, that it's not just to the Jews, but it's to the whole world. Okay, so Jesus is, is the savior of the world, not just to the Jews. What else? What else have we learned about Jesus? That he's, he is God. Okay, that he is God. And this is, this is a claim that he's making fairly openly. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that we, now, we now know 
and we know that he knows. It's interesting that that's the claim that gets inclusive. <coughs> that when, whenever he's on trial there and he says, I am. Yeah. That's what gets him crucified. And that's, we're aware of that. Yeah. Um, it's, it, it, the irony is that's not the case in the other Gospels. No. The other Gospels, it's that claim of tearing down the temple. That's, that, that's what they bring against him. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not until he answers I am that they start ripping their clothes right. and doing all that. Right. So anyway, that's, so we've got this, we, we know more about Jesus than we did before. Now next week we'll look at the, the fifth chapter. We'll look at the fifth chapter. Any, any, any questions? John is, John, some, some cool stuff is going on and goes on in the Gospel of John. So, okay, let's have a word of prayer and then, then go. Yeah, we'll go. Uh, Lord God, thank you so much for giving us this time together. And uh, help, help us, just, just help us recognize that, that you are still the savior of the world. And um, we may be like, sometimes like Jews, and we like to build little walls around you to you know, sort of keep other people out and sort of keep ourselves in. But remind us that you're the light of the world, that you're the savior of the world. And, and help us to celebrate that salvation that flows and that spirit that, that just covers so much. Uh, help us to be able to celebrate with all those who come to an awareness of, of you. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. amen.